you know, this thing used to give us a countdown and it's not giving us a countdown. <laughs> no, I think we're, I can see a live counter now. So I think we're going. Oh, I know we're seeing that just, you know, oh, yes, we are. Okay. I don't know what happened to our <laughs> one thing. I really kind of missed that. So it was anyway, good. We are definitely live. And um, I'm Mitzi Storetto, and I am back with another exciting episode of the best new true crime stories, uh, crimes of famous and infamous criminals. And I am joined by Charlotte Platt, who's up in the wilds of Scotland. I'm as far north as you can go without getting your feet wet. <laughs> <laughs> or falling off, or getting yes. a polar bear, uh, being a polar bear's lunch or dinner. <laughs> or the orcas. Thankfully, our orcas haven't started sinking boats, but the ones in Shetland have, so we're all nervous. Oh dear, yeah, we, we, I, we there's orcas in our hood as well. <laughs> oh, no. Probably used to, probably not used to this as cold Scottish waters. I think mm. you've, you've definitely got it definitely uh, over us. Uh, but anyways, I'm so glad you were able to join us. Uh, we're sort of crossing our fingers here because the last time Charlotte was on, with uh, that was the Small Towns book, if I'm correct, mm. something happened and my internet just got, I just got thrown out of the internet. I was persona non grata and um, I, I had a reboot and all kinds of stuff was going on. So Charlotte was giving us this wonderful tour of Orkney. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really hoping I don't have to have her as a tour guide today, but if we do, it'll be, it'll be London this time. Yes. <laughs> so anyways, I'm really glad you're able to come back and uh, we're here to talk about your story, uh, Lord Lucan, the twice dead aristocrat. Um, you kind of gave us a, a grabber there with the uh, with the name of that title. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of an idea? I, I, I kind of gave a dead giveaway saying London, but the story does take place in London. But uh, tell us a bit about when it takes place, because this is a quite an iconic era for, for a lot of people. It is. And it's it's very much in the heyday Oops, of Charlotte, the... Oh, I can't hear I you. Silly? Oh, can you hear me now? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear okay. me okay now? Something's going on here with the sound. <laughs> I can try muting and unmuting. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we have to, have, something has to always happen. Okay, so you were probably speaking, maybe other people heard you, but I didn't. So what do you want to say what you said again? No problem. So this is very much in the heyday of the the thriving um, era of the London growing as a city, not just in terms of the historical place that it was, but in terms of being the banking sector, in terms of being the place to be. Um, you know, London's always been known as the capital of the, of the UK for its um, history and for this obviously with the Globe Theatre, we've got Shakespeare, etc. But it was really the booming era of the 60s and 70s of it growing to be a commerce and money capital in a way that it still is today, although we're doing our best to ruin that by a Brexit. Um, and it is, you know, it's the time of these rising star socialites in a different way to how we'd seen with the classical aristocracy they weren't behind the shelves anymore. They weren't only seen at the race days and the high tops. They were in the town, they were in their private clubs, they were in the middle of the city, they were very much accessible in a way that we're maybe seeing again today with like influencers, but was a very, very emerging and unusual thing at the time. Um, and that sort of mixing of the private becoming personal, becoming public, um, it's something that is a very big focus for this case because there is such a, I hesitate to say obsession, but there is a sort of fixation on Lucan and what went on with Lucan um, that hasn't disappeared, even though he did, um, <laughs> you know, in the 1970s. So it's a it's a time of the UK in change and in flux, but it's in a way that we see happening again now in a sort of way. Yeah, that's the thing that uh, was interesting when you initially pitched the story to me, and uh, it's it doesn't seem to matter um, what generation you're from. This mm. this is like this sort of this legend, legendary mm. story, and uh, it just 
just keeps going on and on and on, um, which will have you talk a bit about why this story is so uh, fascinating to the Brits, particularly. Um, so, so who is Lord Lucan? Tell us a bit about him. So Lord Lucan, originally Richard Bingham, because the, the Lord title is a, something that you can only get when someone has passed it on, which means they have to pass on, um, was an aristocrat. He was a, a very well-travelled chap. He was born in 1934, so it's right just before the start of the war. He was evacuated out to Wales, as a lot of the children were, just to avoid the Blitz. Um, he spends time there, he comes back, he studies at Eton, of course, um, because the nature of his family, he was always going to go there. Um, he spends time in the US, but he does eventually come back to London. And he begins, um, he spends some time in the army, as he was expected to do. Um, that's almost not notable, because it's such a common thing in the British aristocracy. Everyone shout out Prince Harry. Um, but you know, it is that thing of, it was just one of the things he was anticipated to do after his studies. But he really leaned in to the traveling you know he obviously loved traveling he loved spending time and just savoring life he was someone who very obviously chased excess in that sort of way and he was surrounded in this in the society levels where it would let him you know he had access to the money he had access to the connections he could go as it was called then powerboat racing he could hire private planes he could do all these things to live the biggest largest life that he could and when he eventually came back to London to settle down, um, he became a merchant banker, which is one of the most both high pressure, but one could argue um, easiest jobs that he could have walked into because he had the family connections to go straight into it. He wasn't having to do internships. He wasn't having to do time hopping between different merchant houses to see and learn the skill. He had this perfect situation to walk right into. Um, and he did so. And he did so with gusto. Uh, but he also did that with everything else. I don't think the man understood the idea of moderation. I don't think that was something that um, occurred to him <laughs> at any point. So he was living this very anticipated and expected life of doing the army service, coming back, getting his stable job, mixing at the socials, going and seeing people and that sort of thing. But he was also doing a huge amount of gambling. Um, and it's theorised that he sort of caught the bug when he was in the army because he was a very well-known backgammon player and he was at the races. And to be fair, if you're out and there's not all that much to do, you will go and do whatever it is that's entertaining. So that's playing cards with the lads. That's what you're going to do. That's going to the horse races because it's the only thing that's open. It's what would happen. Um, but he became acknowledged as an incredibly skilled gambler and especially he was in the top 10 backgammon players recognized so you know, he obviously had a talent for it but he's sort of living these parallel lives of doing the thing that he wants with the gambling and with the large life and also doing the things that are expected with getting the sensible job and going to the mixers and eventually finding himself a very lovely wife um and it's just these parallel tracks where you can see he has a sense of duty and he's doing what's expected of him but he's never straying away from also doing all those things that he wants to do. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a high, high play, a high flyer, as they say. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you've referenced in the story where he's pretty much up all night gambling because of the casino hours in London were rather quirky hours, and and <laughs> you had to be pretty much a night owl to to mm -hmm. go gambling legally. But I mean, um, the nightclubs. Uh, what's what's the famous nightclub you referenced? Uh, I mean, it was like a, a celebrity haven. All the all the um, incredible characters of the '60s was Peter Sellers and all those yes. people would go. So that's Annabelle's, which was where Annabelle. the Claremont set met and and was founded. So yes, that was you know that was the place to be. It was the privatest of private clubs. It was the absolute mixture of all the. Um, <sighs> all the bohemians, all the creatives, but also all the old money and all the society. And this sort of very irregular for the time mixing pot where you wouldn't necessarily expect to see that sort of intermingling going on, but it was, and it was exclusive. And you know, it was a very limited amount of people that could get in, but that mix was somewhat unexpected. Yeah, I mean, because um, when you hear him, you know, you, you're saying merchant banker, you're thinking, oh, yawn, 
you know, yeah. but, um, but I mean, uh, this guy was kind of almost living a, a celebrity lifestyle without technically being a celebrity. I mean, he was hobnobbing with all these people. Um, and at one point you mentioned that he was actually being considered for the role of James Bond. Mm -hmm. And you can see why, you know, not only did he know the author, but you know, if you, if you see pictures of, um, of Lord Lucan, he's a very striking gentleman. You know, he was this tall ex-army, very strong featured, very deliberately stylized, attractive man. You can see why he would be considered for Bond and you can see why he would be, as you say, a celebrity while also having to keep him with the, the normal set, while also having to do the things that was anticipated as the eldest son, which um, that melding of the two different lives became quite a tricky thing. Uh, I, I, but I mean, in, in all honesty, as, as a, he sort of was a, this a, a aristocrat celebrity. I mean, he was, a, he was a, in the newspapers. A, I mean, not just the society columns, but I mean, he was quite known to people who didn't even travel in these circles. Am I right? Yes, very much so. Even down to the announcement for his marriage didn't just appear in the broadsheets, it was in the tabloids too. Um, now that is a society event. If it's covering, you know, all the class sets in the UK, that's because people really want to know about it. And he was definitely embracing that sort of fast living, high living lifestyle where it got him attention that you wouldn't necessarily expect, uh, at least certainly the previous generation of aristocracy to want. You know, they didn't want that level of attention, whereas he definitely seemed to revel in it. You know, you could kind of make a bit of a parallel now with the with the royals, the, the younger royals mm -hmm. who have become sort of rock stars, uh, and that's not really how things were done in the past. And 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 mm. ta the fodder of tabloids and books. We shall not mention the name of the most recent one, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just become like a, a you know a Hollywood. Yes, a different yeah. Different of Hollywood. So I, I I guess Lord Lucan was ahead of his time. <laughs> Very much so. And I do think that was one of the things that that fed this um, low-key obsession with it. You know, even when he wasn't here, he was being written about. Even when after things happened, which we'll discuss, and there was a long drawn out process of figuring out what happened. It was constant newspaper fodder. It was constantly there were journalists involved. There, that Even in his absence, his not being there was notable and sufficiently notable that it got people having to live in different houses, it got people hounded, etc. Um, you know, it was very much an early form of the type of press obsession that we see now. Yeah, well, then he, then he became even more famous, perhaps for reasons he would have preferred not to be. But uh, uh, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. before we get into that, tell us a bit about his marriage. Now, he found another society, uh, a, a woman from a high society as well. High, but not high enough. Not um, high enough. <laughs> no, this was one of the interesting controversies. So Lord Lucan, uh, Richard Bingham as he was at the time, because his dad was still alive, um, met his wife Veronica at a social event. And it was a social event where she had been invited because of her sister, who had married into a very wealthy family and as such wanted her sister's company. It was obviously looking for a good match for her sister. That's perfectly reasonable. People do that. Um, but she was of a higher level, you know, her father had been a major, the family was well to do, her mother had remarried into a level of society as well, but there was definitely a class divide there, which was the aristocracy versus the upper middle, um, I would say yes, solidly upper middle, um, you know, the family wasn't in poverty, this was not a Cinderella situation. <laughs> But there was a social commentary that his wife was doing better out of the situation than he was, which um, I think shows a little bit of the usual British classism. Um, yeah. You know, she was marrying a very, again, very attractive. And there's there are very striking photos of the two of them because he is quite a tall gentleman and she is the most petite, tiny bird lady. She is a very, very petite person. She's got the big hair of the time. Um, but even with that, you know, he is head and shoulders above her. They would have been an incredibly striking couple. Um, and it was quite a rapid relationship. You know, they met in the summer and the engagement was announced in the autumn. And then they were getting married, um, which, again, it was appropriate for the time. It was what was anticipated if they were going to be serious. 
um, but it definitely would nowadays be considered a bit of a whirlwind romance. Uh, and then, so, um, what started to go wrong in their marriage? I mean, everything seemed on, on the surface like it was, you know, they, they got married and, you know, kids, the, you know, doing their duty, so to speak, with procreating. Uh, they, they had three children, right? Yes, they have three children in reasonably rapid succession. And they, I mean, there was a strain in the marriage, I would hesitate to say from the beginning, but from reasonably early on because he had um, become a professional gambler. So he'd left his very sensible job. He had commented that he could make more in the tables on a night than he could in a month in his sensible job. And again, one can say, given the era we are in with crypto and influencers, etc., one can understand that sort of logic. It is not alien to us to be able to see that. However, becoming a professional gambler is very expensive. And while he was a very good player, he was not as lucky as he liked to pretend that he was. And while he had received money from his father when he got married, and then his father had unfortunately passed quite rapidly after he'd been married, so he'd inherited, he'd become Lord Luke and he'd inherited titles, he'd inherited money, etc. He was rapidly burning through that. But he didn't disclose that to his wife. He <laughs> continued to live in what she thought was their circumstances. So she was spending a lot of money, but it was because she believed that they were not in financial difficulties. And there was, you know, they have a very infamous and very large property, um, infamous again for reasons we all get into, but that had live-in staff, it had live-in nannies, um, it had running costs, and running costs in London, I mean, now they're astronomical, but even then they were high. Um, you know, there was a, the lifestyle did not match up with the um, actual money that they had. And his wife did suffer quite severely with postnatal depression as well. You know, she's very clearly a very active and a very engaged mother, but she had significant anxiety. She had significant postnatal depression. And there does not appear to have been a lot of support in the marriage for that other than providing staff to assist. Um, and when things started to go very wrong, it seems to have become quite a bitter point that he was very judgmental about her depression and anxiety. And she engaged in relation to it. You know, he tried to have her sectioned and she resisted that, but she did agree to work with doctors. She was engaged in seeing psychiatrists. She does appear to have tried to get what help that she can get. And again, that gets revisited later on in later things that occur. Um, but between the strain of the finances and the strain of that situation, um, it went rapidly downhill and he did end up moving out of the marriage home. Well, you know, and I suppose too, in in that particular time period, uh, postnatal depression or antenatal depression, you wouldn't necessarily um, uh, uh, is now it's more recognized. You wouldn't be committing someone to a mental institution because they had this. No, and I think hopefully there was not. no. Well, hopefully not. Um, <laughs> but yes, I, I think there was just a lack of understanding of how that was actually happening for Veronica, or she, I refer to her as Lady Lucan because that was the title that she got. Um, but you know, I, I don't think there was an understanding of what was going on with her mental health. I think he just saw she can't look after the children, she can't do things, she must be mad. Um, which again, nowadays, there would be a lot more empathy and there would be a lot more understanding. But equally, I do feel it has to be noted she understood that something was wrong and she tried to get help. And even if postnatal depression is not understood in the same way back then, she had enough of a concern that she went and sought help. And I don't think that was given any weight by him at the time. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. And the fact that oh, he also just moved out because I guess he just got fed up with the whole situation. Uh, so obviously then now we have, uh, we've got these live-in nannies anyways, which I mean, they were nannies before, correct? And yes. Mm -hmm. But um, so, all right. So what was the plan now? He's he's moved out. He, he basically ended up moving quite nearby because he clearly, you know, wants access to the children. So, mm -hmm. so what started to, to really go wrong that he kind of, um, you know, that leads up to what happens. 
to the deep end yes well he got very um i i use the term obsessive in the essay and i actually would stand by that he becomes fixated on getting the children back so he goes from living in what was obviously a bachelor pad we would call nowadays to a larger property so he can see the children more frequently and he becomes obsessive about getting the children from his wife and there is not really any actual context for this other than her mental health there is no discussion about why he became so fixated on it now one could look at the situation with the aristocracy background and the the duty as we discussed about having children and that sort of thing and think that he wanted the children with the right type there does seem to be a lot of that in there but even if we move away from the classism and that sort of thing he's just fixated on getting his kids so he starts a campaign of what again would nowadays be recognized as stalking he is having Veronica tracked by private detectives. He is phoning the house with abusive or strange or frankly quite intimidating at times phone calls where he's just heavy breathing down the line. He's yeah. scaring the nannies away. And it's even down to very petty things like he's not paying the milkman or he's cancelling the food orders. And again, depending on how um depending on how wants to, one wants to read the situation, he's either just being a very bitter, nasty ex, or he's trying to induce a breakdown in his ex-wife so he can get the kids. Um, and it does a little bit ring of that, just the constant sniping about money, the scaring the staff away. Um, and it comes to a bit of a crescendo when he actually abducts the children. Um, and this was... Again, one can look at it and think, how on earth did he think he was going to get away with it? Um, but he stops one of the living nannies on the way to school. She's already dropped one of the children off. The eldest girl is already at school, but she's got the younger two. And he lies. Um, he says that the children have become wards of the court, which means they've been taken away from the parent and the court is deciding what's to happen and that he should have them. And it, you, know, you have to picture this. You are a living nanny so you are you are the hired help from this family you know there's a nasty divorce going on and you have this very tall very imposing man with two of his own private detectives so a little bit of the goon squad going on there <laughs> who's telling you the court has said this has to happen you cannot stop it and is taking those two children off you that must have been terrifying and it must have been an awful feeling when she got back to the job and was told actually no that's rubbish you've just let someone nick the children which must also have been a horrible feeling. But you know, I, I do genuinely have so much sympathy for that poor nanny because she was just caught in this horrible crossfire. And then the eldest daughter was picked up from school and Lucan had all three children. So, um, yes, parental yeah. abduction, it's still a problem nowadays. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I mean, his whole, his whole behavior, I mean, it, it is definitely hardcore stalking. And yes. harassment. I mean, there's no other way about that. But I mean, uh, so so what was actually? Uh, but but um, was there any uh, repercussions for for what he was doing to her? Because I mean, he he was really uh, terrorizing his wife. I mean, the woman was already not too mentally stable and need and in need of help, and he's doing this. I mean, this could drive someone to suicide. Yes, and I. <sighs> Again, looking at it with a modern eye, I absolutely think that's what was being aimed for. I think he was aiming to be the driver to a nervous breakdown or to take her own life so he would have the children and not have the issue with having to divorce her. Um, and the, the, the horrible answer is there was not a lot of consequence for him until he nicked the children. Um, but when he did that, it set wheels in motion because she had to go to court to get the children back. And oh. in doing so, as I say, parental abduction is, is a controversial area. Some people don't even like the term, um, but that, that is what it's known as legally. And the court knew this was going to be a very difficult matter. So it set a late calling date. So it gave them three months to get the ducks in a row and say, these are the arguments, etc. And during that time, Lady Lucan engaged the Priory, which is a still in existence private mental health group that you can go to engaged in medication to assist with her anxiety, engaged in speaking to doctors and got not only her own mental health to a level, but actually medical support in relation to it that could be relied on in court. And it's very clear 
Lord Lucan expected when he got to court, he would just be whistling. He very much expected it was going to be an absolute dawdle. He'd explained that his wife was a crazy woman who couldn't possibly be trusted with the children and they should be with him and they were and that was wonderful. And what happened is the judge was incredibly against him because he'd started this all off by abducting the children. And if you're going to go and say this person is unstable, one cannot then be the unstable party. And unfortunately for him, he did not look stable because stalking, harassing, putting your children in a situation of danger, be that through abducting them or through trying to drive their mother to a breakdown or suicide, is not considered stable behaviour. And he actually becomes very fixated about this. You can even see this um, towards the end of the matter that we'll speak about later on. He's just absolutely furious that the court is not looking at it the way that he wants it to. And he is absolutely furious that there is not an immediate approval of the children being with him. And it builds up for, it, it goes on for quite a long time. The arguments are substantial, as are the lawyer's fees. And he goes on to talk very openly that he's in tens of thousands of pounds of debt. And you know, when you're talking about that in the, in the 70s, that's a massive yeah. amount of money. You know, that's more than the money that he would have been making even in his very sensible merchant banker's job in a year. And he is just absolutely up to the gills. The court's against him. His, obviously, his wife's against him. And he is being presented as this unstable, bitter man in a situation where he thinks he should very clearly be the hero. Um, so it's, you know, it's obviously a very dark situation for him, but it's also the inevitable conclusion of the absolute campaign he waged. Well, also, I imagine, I imagine it was a bit of an affront to him as well, being in his position with, you know, high level of, you know, the aristocrat such as he is, that somebody would actually not take his side. He would have assumed it would be a given. You know, I'm Lord Lucan and, you know, this is what I'm saying. And that's, you know, of gossip. course, I'm right. I'm me. Yeah. 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 So I imagine that was quite a, a bit of a slap in the face as well. Um, so. Getting to the point of um, the actual crime, because obviously he he he's in this book because he committed a pretty heinous crime. Um, what uh, give us a bit of an overview then, uh, because this is where everything comes to a head. It does, and it's in the most unfortunate way as well, because you know he is very clearly spiraling. You know he is gambling, but he's not winning. He's drinking, he's chain smoking, his friends are talking to him about he's not well. He's openly talking about murdering his wife. This is the bit I, even when I was writing this, I couldn't get over. He is explicitly and repeatedly talking about how much cheaper it would be if he just kills her. And then someone tries to kill her. And, uh, oh boy, just just the sheer, the sheer follow through on that. So it, the live-in nanny, after Veronica had got the children back from the court, was a lady called Sandra Rivet. And unfortunately, we know Sandra Rivet best for being dead. Um, she is normally, habitually, off on a Thursday evening. That is the day that she has off to do her own thing and is otherwise living in the house. And this particular Thursday, she wasn't off because her boyfriend had had a change of shift, so she had taken Wednesday off to see him instead. And it is just that level of cruel luck and fate that sets this whole thing off, unfortunately, because she is there when she shouldn't be, and when this very, very um, premeditated, anticipated violence happens. So just to set the, the stage and the context in this regard, um, property in London is restricted in how it can be um, developed, A, because of the historical nature, but B, because of space. It is a very built up city already. So what's very common is for buildings to expand down rather than up. So it's quite common to have large basements or basement rooms that are other things. In this particular instance, there was a kitchen in the basement. Um, this um, evening on November the 7th, she goes downstairs to make a cup of tea for her and Veronica and the light is out. And not only is it out, the bulb has actually been removed. So she walks into the kitchen in the dark and is brutally beaten to death with a lead pipe. 
Um, and when I say brutally beaten to death, I'm not trying to be morbid. I mean, her cause of death is listed as blunt force trauma and asphyxiation from the blood caused by it. It is a, it is a savage attack. And her body is bundled into what's suspected to be a postage sack. It's a heavy duty sack. Um, so that occurs. Veronica comes downstairs to see why the cup of tea is taking so long. And she is also attacked. Um, she's also clobbered with the pipe. Someone starts screaming at her and she recognises it as her husband's voice. And when clobbering her with the pipe doesn't work because she's trying to get away, he attempts to strangle her. Very common escalation of domestic violence. Um, but she recognises who it is, um, manages to twist around, and manages to grab him by the crown jewels, so to speak, which pauses his actions. Many gentlemen pause when that occurs. So she is bloodied injured she's bleeding from a head wound because she's been hit by a pipe and realizes it's him realizes what's happened because there's blood that's you know it, it's very clear what's happened and she says to him look you're going to be done for murder but if you are sensible about it i will help you get away but we need to clean me up and we need to make sure that the children are okay and very unfortunately, it is known that the eldest child had, the eldest daughter, had woken up because of the screaming um, and has at least seen her parents bloodied and in a bad situation, if not worse. That's obviously a terrible thing for a child to see, very traumatic. But little ones put back to bed. The separated couple have to figure out what to do. So he tells her to go and sit on the bed and he'll get a basin and a washcloth wash the blood away, look at the wound, get her some painkillers to deal with things. And she goes along with this until he goes into the bathroom and then she promptly runs for her life, which is the right thing to do. Never let them get you to a secondary location, never let them have a second swing. Um, so she runs across the road to the pub, again, covered in blood, screaming, saying that she's been attacked, that her husband's killed the nanny and tried to kill her. And, I mean, again, you have to picture there is this tiny woman you know, she is, she, I think if she's five foot two, that's probably two inches of hair. You know, she is a very, very petite lady. She's covered in blood. She's distressed. She's screaming. And she's screaming that her children are still in the house because all she's been able to do is run. She's not been able to stop and get the kids or anything like that. And again, that must have been harrowing for her, but must have also been terrifying for the pub landlord who encountered her and phoned the police and also phoned an ambulance. So while this is going on, she's getting help and Lucan is disappearing. Um, he's getting this out time, of the This time not with the children, though. No, he left. He actually phones his um, family to make sure that someone is there for the children, which is one of the few points I will give to him. He does <laughs> seek to make sure that someone is looking after the kids, um, and then he scarpers. Wow. And yes, <laughs> and the scarpering is in stages because, of course, it is. It couldn't be straight. Yeah. Forward. Yeah, because I mean, um, he he had, a, a, if I'm correct, a, a number of friends that he was uh, counting on for aiding him and uh, in his f flight. <laughs> yes, there is a. He goes looking for help. So first, he goes to somebody whose child is a friend of his eldest daughter's, and the, the lady's alone at home and doesn't answer the door to some random person hammering on it and phoning the phone. <laughs> Very sensible, good choice. Uh, they only realise it was him later on because there's blood on the doorstep. Oh, um, he phones his mum to explain what's gone on and get her to check on the children. Um, and then he again phones her later on. And by that point, the police are there and he decides he doesn't want to speak to them, but promises them he will call back. He does not call back. Um, and then he starts looking for a route out and he starts driving. And he's not in his vehicle, because why would he do anything that would point the finger at him? Um, he is in a borrowed vehicle that I actually do think that placed a large emphasis on showing not only that it was predetermined, but that he always intended to cover his tracks. Because um, he wasn't using his very notable, publicly known vehicle. He wasn't using anything that would be able to trace back to him. His car was very publicly in his driveway. And it had a dead battery. It wasn't moving and it hadn't moved for a considerable period of time. Um, that's just an alibi being set up in my view. That's only my view. But um, And he goes driving and he's aiming for the coast. So he goes out towards um, East Sussex, which is about a 40 mile trip from London. And he goes to see some of his friends there. And he spins this story, which is the same story that he's told his mum, 
that someone was attacking his ex-wife and he just so happened to be driving by when it happened and he just so happened to look at the basement window and see this attack going on. Um, and just to explain to anyone who's not familiar with basement properties or that sort of thing, the windows in these basement properties is very often maybe the size of your head, if that. They tend to be long, so they can let in as much daylight as possible, but they are not tall. He would have had to have his face pressed to the glass. Now, again, he was stalking her. Perhaps he would have been doing that, but no one believed it. No one really believed it. Certainly the police did not really believe it. Um, and this was only <laughs> emphasised later on when the vehicle was found with a lead pipe and with his favourite brand of vodka and with the said lead pipe having the blood of both his ex-wife and the deceased nanny on it. It does not necessarily lead one to think that one was not involved in the using of said lead pipe. Um, but he goes to see these friends and he explains this terrible situation that's gone on that he's saying. And he then decides he's going to go and leave some letters, some statements of intent. So he does two letters to his brother-in-law and he does one letter to one of the heads of one of the private clubs that he is with, who is also the person whose car he is driving, which is full of incriminating evidence. Just what you want for a friend. And um, the letters are, are genuinely quite despairing. Again, to look at this with empathy and to look at this in the context of not being the person that you're trying to kill, etc. There is a clear desperation in them. You know, and there is certainly in the more private one, his brother-in-law gets two letters. One sets out the financial circumstances um, and is obviously trying to set affairs in order. And the other is a more personal talk about what happened and where Lucan is and how he's feeling and that sort of thing. And it is very hard to look at those now and not feel that there's a certain level of suicide ideation. Um, you know, you have someone who is very obviously emotionally exhausted. You have someone who is very obviously in a state of agitation or possibly close to mania. Um, and, you know, this is a man who clearly had this dual life of duty versus expectation, and this habit of obsession, but he's also had gambling addiction. He's also had a certain level of alcohol dependency, if not alcoholism, because of the gambling addiction. You know, you have someone who is run to the very ends of their nerves, and he's talking about going and laying low for a while, but he'll definitely sort things out when he's back. And it is very easy to see that as a situation of someone sort of preparing a last goodbye or that sort of thing. And that's a very hotly contested situation, obviously, as we'll discuss. But there is a there is a very genuine look of someone setting things in order so they're not going to come back, um, and it's quite a it's quite a tricky balance to appreciate there because obviously no one wants someone to be in that situation, but the man had very firmly driven himself literally into that situation. So, um, and leaving those letters, he then leaves his friends and drives off down towards a port because it very much looks like he was aiming for a ferry. Um, although, by that point in time, the police had been notified and he was a wanted man. Um, because of the death, because of the body that he'd left in the property, he hadn't taken steps to remove the body or anything like that, she was still dead in a sack in the basement. Um, there is a very clear beeline for one of the channel ferries. Now, no one knows if he made it to the ferry or not. They know the car is found in the port town and there is no trace of Lucan. Which leads to a vast conspiracy theory or set of conspiracy theories about did he reach the boat despite being looked for? Could he have gotten to the boat and simply bribed his way on? The man was an aristocrat. Okay, he didn't have any money and was contemplating murder his wife to avoid bankruptcy. But did he pawn something off? Did he give an heirloom? Did he get himself onto the boat? Or did he throw himself into the channel? Or did he wander off onto the moors and lie down and die? There is a there's a huge debate and a huge conspiracy in relation to that, but he just drops off the map. He is gone. Well, we don't want to give away the total punchline, so to speak, with the twice-dead aristocrat, but um, I think this is one of the reasons why this case has just stuck in, the, uh, in, in, the, in everyone's mind for just decade after decade after decade, because it's just this open-ended thing. 
is he dead? Did he die from his own hand? Did he escape? Uh, uh, we've got references to sightings of him, what, as far away as Australia, if I'm correct? Oh, yes, yes. And, yeah. and pretty consistently, which is the strange thing. Um, <laughs> Very, very um, inconveniently, he's actually rumbled quite a few people who were busy pretending they were dead. Um, you know, potential <laughs> sightings of Lord Lucan have unearthed two people who were busy committing fraud, pretending that they died and living elsewhere. Which is, you know, it just it's going to feel like a kick in the teeth if you put all the effort into your own death and then you're not even found to be yourself. Someone thinks you're Lord Lucan instead. That's just got to be a bit insulting. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just bizarre. Um, if I'm correct, also one of the relatives of uh, was it the son of the nanny or someone related to the nanny um, is is kind of on his own campaign about Lucan and where Lucan is, right? If, yes. If so I Sandra Rivet had had a son who she gave up for adoption. Uh, it wasn't until actually into the 1990s that the gentleman discovered who his biological family were. And again, one can somewhat understand why that might have been something that being kept from a child, given the extreme yeah. media circus around what went on with that murder and the, and the brutality of it and not wanting to expose someone to that. But he discovers that he is the son of this poor murdered woman. And he has gone on an absolute campaign to try and have this addressed and to try and follow up. He felt the most um, realistic sighting was the sighting in Australia because there was an older gentleman who was very firmly suspected, at least in terms of looks, to be um, Lord Lucan. Although the attempt for any actual DNA testing is obviously going to be its own massive contention. Um, because number one, if you were, you wouldn't really put yourself forward for DNA testing, would you? Yeah. Um, but number two, the international element, you know, getting someone compelled from literally the other side of the world is an incredibly difficult thing. Um, how old would Lucan be now if he if he's alive? Oh, he would be pushing into his, he'd be clocking towards his 90s. Um, okay, but and, so, so conceivably he could be alive then. Yes. Oh, yes. It, had he had a hale and hearty life and had he stopped with the chain smoking and drinking, then yes, it, conceivably he could still be around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wasn't there a, a, a corrupt British uh, politician who showed up on the beach in Australia some decades ago? Oh, yes. And there's, I mean, we... <sighs> I blame this on us being an island, but the UK has a freakishly high level of people pretending they're dead and then popping up again. We've had the canoe <laughs> man. We've had I'm this chat. We've had that. It's, again, the only thing I can think of is we have a lot of water for people to be lost in. But it is, yeah, if people are trying to fake their own death, loads of people go off into the water and then they pop up on another beach. It is a, you'd think it was sufficiently well known that it doesn't work by this point. Yeah, that's a pretty far away beach from Britain, though. I mean, yeah. true, true. <laughs> I mean, can you find a farther any beach that's farther? But I mean, that's as far as you could almost go. <laughs> but it is. There's also a lot of expats in there. Go somewhere. Where there's not so many British tourists. We're everywhere. Yeah. Go somewhere else. Yes, <laughs> you, when you're not noticed. Yes, lend, oh, lend yeah. a bit. Well, I mean, you know, that's it, this, it's the stuff of legend, and and just um, uh, I, you just wonder how how long we're going to have people popping up with with theories or sightings. Um, I mean, I suppose at some point, if he's if he's going to be like a hundred or more than a hundred, it'll have to kind of die out. Not to be funny, but um. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think it's easy to understand why there is such an obsession as, as you say, it is this big open question. It is this thing of, and I think there's a certain element of people almost rooting for him to have survived because it would just be that perfect topping off to this extraordinary life. You know, this living big, living large, refusing to go only one way, living both lives, having all of the things that he did in his youth. If he was able to continue that and escape consequence, now obviously we don't want him to, he should be held in regard for what happened. But I can understand why there is some little anarchistic, chaotic desire for him to still be out there. Um, but yes, after a certain point, he will just statistically not still be here anymore. So <laughs> perhaps yeah. that will settle it. And going by the strikes against him with his drinking and smoking and whatnot. Um, mm. Well, it's it's a it's a totally mad story, really. And um, uh, I mean, just 
you you know people don't necessarily think uh, aristocrats are that colorful <laughs> no no definitely not and usually they pay not to be you know again yeah. the uk the land of the super injunction there's a lot of people awfully willing to spend money to keep things quiet and that was just something that he never did he reveled in it yeah 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 he definitely didn't fit the mold as far as that i mean i i suppose maybe if it, it was today um he, he'd fit right in <laughs> <laughs> oh, if it was today, we'd have live streams about it. Airing it, the oh. dirty laundry and all of that. But at this particular time period, it really wasn't done. No, and it was scandalous. And that actually became part of the thing during the police investigation. People would not talk. People of his background, people of his family and friends would not speak to the police because you simply didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although I think there was also some uh, thought that perhaps they were protecting him as well. And, you know, one has to wonder. I mean, he was their friend. Uh, Again, if we go back to the classism element and the, the bad feeling towards his wife, yes, I absolutely think there was an element of, well, he's one of ours and you're not getting him. Even if yeah. we knew where he was, we wouldn't tell you. Yeah, um, yeah. Whether they did or not is the matter for debate. But I think even if they did, they wouldn't pass the information on. Yeah, yeah. I, it just seems it seems logical that they kind of kept shtum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we've been discussing uh, Lord Luke and the twice dead aristocrat, which is Charlotte Platt's story. Um, do you have any uh, interesting projects you'd like to tell us about or projects that aren't so interesting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I when I'm not doing true crime, I am a horror and speculative fiction writer. So I have stories coming out most recently. I had one in Cat's Cast. That was super fun. That was one of my favorite spooky cat stories. Um, I have a more true crime leaning horror story coming out with Creepy Pod soon. I think that's going to be out in August. Um, I am currently shopping a novel. I've got full requests out with about three different people at the moment. Obviously, we always hope we can sell a novel to trad publishing, but if not, I have an indie press that's also interested, as are. Um, and other than that, I am just, I'm writing, just writing lots of different bits and pieces. Well, sounds good. Well, uh, good luck on the novel. Yes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long slog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It is. I think but I think really love it. Lord Lucan's uh, gambling probably is <laughs> winning easier than China. <laughs> oh, it can feel that way. The trenches are hard, but but we, we love it. Take a backgammon on the side. <laughs> it works for him, right? <laughs> Not sure if I'll make it to the top ten players in the UK though. <laughs> Oh, well, I really appreciate you coming on again. And again, uh, the uh, story is in the best new true crime stories, crimes of famous and infamous criminals. And mm -hmm. Lord Lucan qualifies as a famous and an infamous criminal vote. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thanks so much and uh, all the best of luck. And uh, it was good to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Bye, everyone.